Has your journey with osteoarthritis been a bumpy one? Have you come to a fork in the road and chosen a treatment option or a decision choice that you otherwise have come to regret? But I think importantly, have you learned from that fork in the road? Have you gained insight from making that decision? And or could we learn from one another? Do your fellow people with osteoarthritis and the stories that they tell, can that inform your journey? On this week's episode of Joint Action, we'll be chatting to Steve O'Keefe and his experience with living with osteoarthritis and his passion and persistence in finding a cure. Steve was diagnosed with osteoarthritis in both his elbows in November and subsequently in both shoulders, knees, and hips. He's tried a range of different treatments, including rest, massage, physiotherapy, platelet-rich plasma, and exotic offshore stem cell treatments. Today, Steve's been kind enough to share with us his personal journey, his rigorous efforts to find a cure, and his insights in living with osteoarthritis. Steve's a 56-year-old father of three. He lives in Alexandria, Virginia, five miles from the White House in Washington, D.C. He spent 25 years building his own marketing and publishing company in the tech space, and he served on the U.S. Service Organization Board for 15 years, which is the largest not-for-profit supporting U.S. military and their families. He's physically active. He does resistance and cardio training. He grew up playing a lot of sports and got back into working out very regularly about 17 years ago. He's got osteoarthritis in both his elbows and subsequently been diagnosed with osteoarthritis elsewhere. Hello, Steve, and welcome to the show. Good morning and good afternoon, (laughs) David. Thank you for the opportunity to chat. No, great pleasure. And it's, I think, a really important story and I think something that hopefully others can learn from your experience and the journey that you've been on. But before we get into that, just wondering if you could share with the listeners a little bit more about your background and what a typical day looks like. I am retired. So I spent 25 years building and running a tech marketing and publishing firm in Alexandria, Virginia. So I'm just outside of Washington, DC. And I'm pretty much on a quest full time to try and work out how to deal with this arthritis situation. Yeah. And that's obviously how we met through the US Arthritis Foundation. We linked up and, uh, you know, I think part of that was really just your enthusiasm about pursuing something. And I think it's a really interesting story. And again, something that hopefully, hopefully we'll get into a little bit more. Now, when you're not pursuing the osteoarthritis question, what do you enjoy doing? Uh, I like to work out as best I can, given my current situation. I've got three children, two of them in college, uh, one of them in high school. So hang out with them. We have a dog. I like to, to walk Finley with my wife. So uh, yeah, those types of things. Yeah, no, superb. And, you know, I, I think we'll hopefully get into a little bit about your experience living with this illness in a second. For your description of yourself, if you had to choose five words to describe yourself, what would they be? I would say persistent, curious, persistent, persistent, and persistent. <laughs> And great, great qualities to have, I think, particularly as you're passionately trying to pursue uh, this journey of osteoarthritis. Now, let's talk a little bit about your experience with this illness. How did you come to develop osteoarthritis? It's a curious question. I'm not sure. (laughs) I have worked out for years, was very active as a kid growing up and started lifting weights when I was about 39, I'm 56 now. So very regularly. I had some minor joint issues. I had some PRP. I had some stem cells in the knees um, and the like. And I really looked at these treatments as sort of a pit stop. I would just pull in, get a treatment and go back out. And nobody mentioned the word arthritis to me until November of last year, when I went into a meeting with a consult with an orthopedic surgeon, and he told me that I had devastating arthritis in both elbows. Yeah, it's a day I'll never forget. Now, just let's unpack that a little bit further. So 
you know, obviously from a, the reason you developed osteoarthritis and just looking at you now, and obviously never met you in person, but you don't have, I guess, the most common risk factor, that being a person above a healthy weight. But have you been above a healthy weight at some point in your life? No. No. Any family history at all that you're aware of? No. No substantive joint injuries that you've ever had at any period of time? No. In fact, um, you know, when I subsequently, and I've met with a lot of orthopedic surgeons, I don't really like any of them, to be honest. But, you know, the first question is, well, did you fall off a motorcycle? Did you have some kind of significant trauma? And the answer is no. Yeah. And so the, the most common risk factors are the ones that we've just spoken about. So would, that would be being above a healthy weight, a joint injury, and a family history. But underneath that, there's a range of other risk factors that you know we could probably dig into at some point in time, but includes you potentially having a genetic mutation, having occupational risk, which I doubt, given what I know of people who work in your business, would likely put themselves at risk of, of osteoarthritis. And so, you know, I think it's it's important, I guess, to recognize that sometimes we never work it out. But I guess the critical thing is that you've now got this illness. And, you know, I think part of the journey for you is not only working out how you got it, but probably most importantly, what you do about it from here. When you said you saw the surgeon, they used the word devastating. Is is that true? Yes. He told me I could never do another push up, never do another pull up. And the journey, the journey continues. I mean, so I went out and got x-rays and MRIs of my other joints um, immediately after I found out that I had arthritis in my elbows. And the, and the elbow arthritis is in the radial capitellum joint, which I didn't know that I had a radio, radial capitellum joint. And I subsequently found out that I have arthritis in my shoulders, uh, in my knees, and I also have a hip impingement and all of those are bilateral and do you get symptoms from all of those areas i get symptoms from the from the knees with a lot of cracking and popping and some pain i get a lot of cracking in my shoulders as well so let me just say i was so pleased when i found your podcast because it was me and google against the world and i spent a lot of time googling and contacting people and i've met with a lot of very interesting people but having that on ramp would have been super useful to me in November of last year. One of the things I thought was frustrating, sorry, in one of those podcasts was a very nice doctor and he gave a very compelling story, but he said people should not get x-rays and imaging done of their other joints, which I think is completely crazy, by the way. And I thought it was also interesting that he said that he had done it and then he wishes that other people didn't do it. I think you have to do it. I don't understand why anybody wouldn't. Yeah, and I think it's it's complicated. But so let's let's dig into that a little bit further. So you've obviously gone off and you've pursued getting imaging done of multiple joint areas, some of which you're getting symptoms from, some of which you're not. I think for a lot of people, they're given the message, not dissimilar to what you're given, that if you've got imaging and you've got quite bad osteoarthritis in different joint areas, that you're told not to use that particular part of your body, which is really the wrong message and or I think a lot of people when they have marked features structurally of osteoarthritis on imaging studies they're told well you know you've got a tear in the meniscus or you've got some roughness in the cartilage or you've got some thickness of the synovium the lining of the joint and that we should probably go in and clean those areas up arthroscopically and we know for a fact that that's not necessarily going to be in the best interest of the patient and so I think the the story that I, I guess I often see in clinic and the reason I might get imaging done is if it were to change the management that I'm going to pursue with that person. And so if the imaging is going to either A, discourage them from participating in activities that they otherwise should be doing, or B, drive them towards a surgical intervention that we know is not going to be serving them well longer term then there's no benefit from a diagnostic perspective in getting the imaging because we should be able to diagnose that clinically based upon how you present. So that's your history, the features on examination. We should be able to diagnose osteoarthritis 
with pretty good sensitivity and specificity just using our simple clinical tools without the benefit of imaging and without the risks that imaging ensues as far as discouraging you from being active or encouraging you to pursue a surgical intervention. Does that help to clarify, I guess, the perspective that we don't want imaging done in most people or not? Honestly, I feel like it's quite a patronizing approach. I don't like that. I always want to know. And so, for example, with the hip impingement, I don't have symptoms yet. But I used to run, you know, four or five miles at a time. If I continue to run on those hips, they will become symptomatic. I know that. So I've had to substitute that for riding an elliptical machine, which I really don't love. But, you know, I think there are some modifications that you need to make in order to, you know, stopping exercising altogether is obviously not a good idea. And, you know, in terms of I have meniscal tears, I've had them for years, I'm not planning on having those I'm operated on, I don't think that's going to solve the problem. But understanding the extent of what's going on, especially when you get to trying to understand the subcategory of arthritis that you may have, is is very important, I believe. And I think for someone who's got great health literacy, and communicates well and understands that, and it's not going to take the messaging from an adverse imaging study as a discouraging recommendation as far as their pursuit of activity, I have no issue. The issue relates to A, the cost, B, the fact that sometimes people get discouraged from pursuing management that's optimal and get directed towards uh, something that Uh, may not be favorable for them in terms of arthroscopic surgery, for example. Can I just pick up on something that you said, though? So I don't structurally know what you've got going on in the hips, but I would assume it's some degree of uh, shape change around the femoral head neck junction. So you presumably got a cam deformity or something something of that nature. That's right, yeah. So I think just bear in mind that those features are incredibly common in the general community. I'm not suggesting that it will never become a problem, but for the vast majority of people who have that structural change, it's never a problem in their future. So the frequency with which people have that structural deformity, that shape change at the femoral head neck junction, far surpasses the likelihood of a person developing hip osteoarthritis. So just because you've got one, definitely does not mean you're gonna get the other. So again, I'm not telling you to say, go and keep running and you don't need to stick on the elliptical, but bear in mind that the vast majority of people who have that ham deformity don't develop hip osteoarthritis, irrespective of the activity they pursue. Okay. Okay. Does it increase your risk? Very likely, but it doesn't necessarily mean one and the same thing as far as you've got cam, you're going to get hip osteoarthritis. Well, I do have label tears as well, but yeah, I hear you. I hear you. Yeah. Yeah. So again, I guess just for the simple messaging for most people, not encouraging most people to get imaging because it's for most people, I don't think it's necessarily going to change the direction with which they pursue management. Mm. But Steve, I guess while we're on it, has it changed? I mean, it's obviously changed what you do as far as physical activity is concerned. Has it changed the management at all as far as the management of your osteoarthritis from getting the imaging studies done? Yeah, I think that understanding what's going on, I mean, immediately after I found out that I had the arthritis in my elbows, my knees started to give me trouble, which is a little bit of a surprise to me. And so when I got the images, I found out that I had patellofemoral chondromalacia. And so when I went to get stem cells, which I did in the Cayman Islands, I had them treat all four joints. Yeah. So... Let's pick that apart a little bit first. So the chondromalacia and the patellae. So just for everybody who's out there, basically that's the back of the kneecap. The cartilage is a little bit thin on presumably some of the imaging studies that you've had done. Before we dig too much into the stem cell piece, what interventions have you tried during the journey that you've had with this, Steve? And just, it doesn't need to be a long laundry list, but just give us some sense of the journey that you've been on. Yeah, physical therapy and stem cells. Over the years, One thing I would say to the orthopedic profession, and I look at most of these guys as mechanics, and it is very much guys, it's very male-dominated environment, they can be very flip, they can be very patronizing. I wish they would just say the A word. What's the A word? Arthritis. And I I think think arthritis, to me, 
um, when when the doctor told me I had arthritis, he could have easily, as easily have told me I had a venereal disease. That was the impact that it had on me. It was really very, very shocking, to be honest. And so when I went back and looked through my MRIs and my scans over the years, I had patella femoral chondromalacia 10 years ago. I was treated with synvisc. I had PRP. I had bone marrow stem cells in the knee, but nobody said it was arthritis. And if I'd known that I was developing arthritis earlier, it would have modified my behavior. I would have stopped lifting so heavily. Back to January of last year, I was diagnosed with uh, the elbow arthritis in November of that year. I went to see a doctor um, because I was having some clicking noises, and he told me I had some degeneration. And I asked him if I should continue to lift, and he said, yes, go ahead. You should continue to lift. Um, you know, the words that we use to clarify this problem are often couched in a way that we don't want to be harmful. And I say we loosely here, but I completely get where you're coming from as far as being transparent and honest. You know, I think if we try to sugarcoat things too much, uh, I don't think necessarily the messaging comes across. So I think it's, you know, if you've got arthritis or osteoarthritis in those joints, I think it's only fair to be told that's what you have. Now, like you, I think for many people that insidious progression where oftentimes there is some local structural change in the absence of important symptoms, and I'm not suggesting clicking is not an important symptom, but I'm suggesting that that evolution from local structural change in the kneecap joint to subsequently developing pain, stiffness, loss of function often takes decades, so not dissimilar to what your experience has been. And I think the key message I'm getting from you is that if, you know, if I had have met you back then and you had known that story back then, I probably would have suggested to you to modify, you know, deep deadlifts, for example, to modify some of the strength work that you may have been doing at the time and to optimize interventions, again, not having had the opportunity to see you physically, that might uh, optimize the alignment of the kneecap with regards to femur. So whether that's, you know, concentrating on the position of the femur and your gluteal strength, concentrating on the position of your feet, those sorts of things, which, you know, I think frequently get ignored and potentially to a person's detriment. The grab bag of terms that clinicians use, and I'm sure you've probably heard all of these, whether it be degenerative joint disease, bone and bone, wear and tear, don't convey accurately what's going on. And I, I think, you know, probably from your perspective, you just get lost in some of the jargon there. And I think if you were just told that you had osteoarthritis in those joints, probably would have been a hell of a lot easier for you. Yeah, I mean, I would lift, I would lift you know, a lot of heavy weight. It's my personality. I would do, you know, 25, 26 pull-ups, no problem. I'd squat over 300 pounds. And that's, you know, I was never told to stop doing that. And I think that that really had an impact. And I wish I'd known. Yeah. Now, just digging in a little bit into your injection journey, so to speak, you know, you've had PRP, you've had hyaluronic acid injections, you've had stem cell injections. What what drove you in the direction of that? Was that advice you were given? Was it your own research? Um, and do you mind, I guess, elaborating a little bit on, you know, particularly if it was driven by clinicians, how much it cost and where that money went as far as you're aware? Yeah, I mean, I've had, I had PRP, bilateral PRP for uh, golf and tennis elbow. I had PRP in the shoulder for a labral tear. Um, I had bone marrow stem cells in my left knee, 45 injections in a week, very painful. I had uh, adipose injections in my shoulder, absolutely barbarous. I, I would, you know, criminal how painful that was. I'm not somebody that really blanches from pain, but that really was something. And that was all before, you know, I was aware that I had arthritis. And then when I had, you know, the arthritis, I went to the Cayman Islands in March and I had bone marrow extracted, stem cells processed back out there in April and they augured the bones and injected into 
the bones. I had all four joints done, which I would never recommend to anybody. I had success with PRP in the elbows in terms of dealing with tennis and golf elbow. It, it solved the problem very quickly. I think it probably masked a bigger problem that was going on there, to be quite honest. As far you know, the, the thing that's challenging is if you're in a situation where there's nothing to do, what do you have to lose? In terms of cost, the adipose stem cells in the shoulder were about $10,000. The most recent course, which was both elbows and both knees, was $39,000. I think the frustrating piece of it is you feel like you're kind of being scammed by some of these doctors, and they lead you up the garden path in terms of what you can expect. And they've even, you know, in writing, said, you will get better. This notion that you, know, you will have these stem cell injections and everything will be back as it was before um, is inferred. Yeah, and I, I would imagine from your perspective, your motivation to pursue it would have, in large part be driven by the verbiage that gets used in their confidence about the benefits or not of the injection. And when they, you know, when they said, this is going to help you or whatever it is that they said, and this is going to cure your problem. Did they talk at all about the evidence in terms of efficacy, side effects in numbers that were clear as to the fact that they were being honest and transparent about these interventions, whether that be the stem cells or, or PRP? I think, so in fairness, I have had success with PRP historically. I think surgeons are very arrogant, um, to be honest, and they'll throw stuff around. And these regenerative guys are, you know, jocks. Um, and so they'll, they'll throw it out there. No, there was no specific evidence provided. I mean, would I do it again if I were back then? Yes, I would. I would, you know, I, it's impossible to say knowing what I know now, um, would I do it again? Probably not. But if I was back where I was, I would do it again. I, you know, if, if there's a chance of, of finding a cure, I, I would do it again. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, one of the main reasons why I really wanted to chat to you today is that, you know, I think your journey is incredibly illustrative. You're not alone in pursuing interventions and paying a lot of money for osteoarthritis management and the journey that you've been on hopefully has uh, been educational and informative about what works and what's not working and hopefully what's going to be beneficial for you longer term I'm, and i'm not suggesting uh, with that response that you necessarily have the complete answer as to the way you're going to manage your osteoarthritis moving forward and, and i guess that's in, in part where I'd like to dig a little bit further. You know, obviously there's a substantial cost. Uh, you've gone through substantial pain and having these various therapies. Are there other downsides from your perspective in terms of, you know, not having pursued other treatments that may be more effective or are there other downsides that you're aware of? Downside? No, I don't think so. I mean, I think that's also something that is compelling because, I feel like my knees are honestly probably worse after doing the stem cells than they were before, although it's difficult to quantify. The place that I've gone, um, David, is pursuing the science. And I think this has been uh, you know, a very interesting journey. And we chatted a little bit about it. I think that the paper that you sent me on disease-modifying osteoarthritis drugs was really, really valuable because I had been Googling and, you know, I found, and I, I want to talk a little bit about what's going on in Basel, Switzerland, but, you know, I found a series of treatments out there that are promising and understanding the science, this has been a real odyssey for me. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I you know, I, I think it's fascinating listening to you and looking at the journey that you've been on and that discovery. I guess just to, to touch upon a couple of points before we get into the disease modification piece, the, st the standard parlance that I currently use when I'm talking about both platelet-rich plasma, so that's the PRP and the stem cells, is that we don't currently have sufficiently rigorous evidence to advocate that people do that for their osteoarthritis. Is that to say that long-term, neither of them are likely to show effects? No, it just means we don't currently have the evidence. So if you hear me talk, I'm never going to be advocating for stem cells or PRP until we have better evidence. And we're doing research in this space, and hopefully we'll be able to generate evidence that will change 
and guide the treatments down the track. Now, Steve, you're you're right in trying to point out the promise around this whole area of disease modification, and it's a rich it's a rich area of research interest of ours and and other groups. And there's lots of active trials going on in this space, and some of them definitively, at least from my perspective, show a lot of promise. So we've demonstrated now with a couple of different interventions that we can definitely modify structure. And there I'm, you know, alluding to trial results that have come through from both Spree Furman, uh, demonstrating benefits in terms of cartilage thickness. The Biosplice product, I always struggle with the name, has also demonstrated some structural benefits in subgroups of people similar to the Spree Furman product. As, as has the product that tissue gene is developing and, you know, others. So we're, I'm just grabbing a few. So we can definitely show that we're able to modify structure. And structure here that I'm referring to is the preservation of cartilage thickness, typically in the, the tibiofemoral joints or in the inside compartment, the medial compartment of the knee. Everything's about the knee. That's everything I've learned. Or, you know, it seems like that's the real focus. Yeah. And, you know, and I humbly apologize for that, but that's where a, a substantial amount of the community burden is. And hopefully once we're sure. able to demonstrate things in the knees, then we'll be able to move, move on to other joints. The challenge that we're having at the moment is oftentimes there's a bit of a disconnect here between what we're able to do as far as structural preservation is concerned and what a person feels. And so in the trials, whilst they've been able to demonstrate benefits as far as structure is concerned, we haven't necessarily been able to demonstrate the same as far as symptoms are concerned. So, you know, as we and other groups are working on different ways of assessing structure and different ways of assessing symptoms that hopefully might draw a bridge between the two. But it's an incredibly promising area of research and hopefully something that uh, will lead to registrable drugs that people will be able to access I would hope, within the next five years. Right. I mean, I think we need to get out of the lab into the clinic. And I think that, you know, I wish I knew nothing about arthritis. I wish that I couldn't spell it, I couldn't smell it, and I couldn't feel it. But none of those are true. And so I am completely focused in terms of how do we drive this forward? I think one of the things that I've learned, the more I learn, the more disappointed I am, is that Osteoarthritis is not one disease. It is a multifactorial disease. And, you know, not to get into too much jargon, because I know we didn't want to do that, but understanding like phenotypes, endotypes, understanding what slice of this disease you have seems to me to be critical in terms of finding a cure. Yeah. And I think we're only just beginning to understand the importance of that and potentially to develop resources that will help to identify subgroups of people that might be more amenable to particular types of therapy. And that's the therotype story that, you know, I think the oncologists have been on for a long period of time that we're really just beginning. Now, Steve, you've, you've gone down this rabbit hole a fair way and you touched upon some of the products that you find more interesting. From a mechanistic perspective, are there things that you find particularly appealing and or, and knowing full well that some of the people that listen to this podcast are scientists, are there pathways that you think we as a scientific community should be pursuing more strongly? I don't know if I'm qualified, honestly, to answer that question. I can provide the perspective of the customer. And, you know, my whole career has been focused on taking new technology to market. Uh, you know, I've testified on both the House and Senate side in the U.S. in front of the Congress. Um, I'm a jack of all trades and a master of none. But I think bringing the patient's voice into the equation, I think that the orthopedists that essentially want to replace joints as quickly as they possibly can and move on to the next thing, I think orthopedists see you know, everything to them you know, as a nail because all they have is a hammer. So I think bringing the patient voice into the equation, having conversations about things like stem cells and where they fit is you know, very, very important. Yeah. And are there parts of the journey? I mean, you've, you've mentioned orthopedists a few times, but are there parts of your journey that you've been quite dismayed about? Whether that be, you know, the, the myopic focus of, 
particular clinician groups, whether it's the fact that you have to go in so many different directions to get the treatment that you're after? I think that the absence of information for a patient who is diagnosed is really terrible. And, you know, like I said, I found your podcast. I, I You know, I Googled arthritis everywhere but Sunday, but I didn't find your podcast for a year. And that should have really been the first place that I went to get educated because I spent so much time reading, you know, paper after paper after paper and really not understanding what was going on. There needs to be an on-ramp for the stuff, and I think there needs to be more advocacy. Yeah, and I, you know, I'd, I'd really appreciate your insights and hopefully you lending a hand in, in making that sort of thing happen because, you know, I think passionate voices like yours are sorely needed and I don't think we necessarily engage with patients as well as we could. There are strong efforts around the world, uh, particularly led by people in the UK, but also to some extent Australia, in Australia about patient and public involvement and engagement in the research, but also hopefully informing us as to the way we best interact, interface with patients and provide care for patients. Because you know, I think on all levels, we could do a hell of a lot better. So I'll be leaning on you to give us advice and guidance in in that a little bit as well. From the perspective of uh, advice for people out there who have osteoarthritis, Steve, um, and learning what you've learned along your journey, are there particular pointers that you'd like to give for people out there with osteoarthritis that might help them with the journey that they're undertaking? I think, you know, don't give up is, is very important. Now, I, I can't presume to tell people how to deal with their osteoarthritis. And I think the shock of it is enormous. And honestly, I think the psychological impact is is really quite devastating. So, um, you know, don't give up. Don't let doctors tell you how to deal with your osteoarthritis. Be as active as you can. You know, look at the horizon. Um, there's a drug coming out of Novartis called LNA043. It is a cartilage anabolic, so it creates new cartilage. It's in phase 2B. Um, of course, everything is focused in the knee. This race is not finished. And honestly, I wish I'd developed osteoarthritis 10 years from now, but here we are. Yeah. No, I mean, I think I think your your explanation, the journey that you've been on, and the fact that you've you're digging down into this this rabbit hole is so so meaningful but i think the most important thing you just said is really the proactive stance that you're taking and and being positive and pursuing pursuing answers i'll be completely honest with you there's a lot we need to know there's a hell of a lot we don't know um and you know as a clinician that disappoints me because it you know i i really feel for the patients who are out there myself included, who has osteoarthritis. Um, but as a researcher, that's exciting, you know, and I know that's probably not the right thing to be saying to this audience. But as a researcher, you like to walk into relatively virginal fields and be able to test the waters and explore new paradigms. And for osteoarthritis, there's so much we don't know that for me, at least as a, as a researcher, is incredibly exciting. And, you know, Really looking forward to continued conversations with you, Steve, about how best we might continue to do that with a greater ear towards the important voice of the consumer and I guess the guidance that they can give on that journey. So with that, Steve, any final words, thoughts, wisdom? Right about wisdom. I would say, you know, two patients, keep your head up. You know, I've always been a self-starter and candidly, I thought that I could fix anything. I've always done that my whole life. I've started companies. I've dealt with adversity. This has been the hardest thing that I've ever had to deal with. The reality of getting older is dreadful. And you know, you're Australian. I'm sure you're tracking David Sinclair and the anti-aging initiatives that he's purporting. So that's exciting. A huge part of this disease is in your head. And depression is definitely a real thing. So, you know, talk to people talk to your family and don't give up. Great message and something that I think is incredibly important for people to hear. So on that note, Steve, thank you so much for sharing with us your story, sharing with us uh, some of your time, your insights, and really looking forward to continuing conversations with you.
David, thank you for your leadership. It's been a, a life raft or a life belt in uh, very turbulent waters to meet you. And I've appreciated the knowledge that you've shared. Absolute pleasure. So I think there's a lot we can learn from one another. I think the stories that different people tell about their journey with osteoarthritis can be illustrative and hopefully help people when they come to their own fork in the road to make the decision that's in their best interests. I think it's important for me to say that Steve's journey is illustrative. It's his own individual journey. And just because he's had adverse or positive experiences with one thing or another does not necessarily mean it's going to translate to you. I similarly cannot advocate for any of the treatments that Steve's mentioned that he's passionate about. But again, this is an incredibly promising area. And hopefully one or more of those will come through in pivotal trials and demonstrate benefits to you as a consumer with osteoarthritis. So again, it's an illustration. It's hopefully helpful and informative for you as you pursue your own journey. But like Steve, I'd really encourage you to be proactive in pursuing an answer, finding out what works best for you and supporting others around you. I think that part of the puzzle here and trying to find peer support and support the cause of osteoarthritis is critically important. Thank you again so much for your attention today, for your continued support of the podcast and really looking forward to talking to you again soon. Between now and when we next speak, please take care of yourself and if you have the chance, someone else as well. Thanks for listening to Joint Action with David Hunter. If you like our show and want to know more, visit www.jointaction.info. If you have any questions, you can email us at hello at jointaction.info and follow us on Twitter at jointactionorg. This podcast was hosted by David Hunter, edited by Vicky Duong, music produced by Jordan Hunter. The information posted on this podcast is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent disease. Anyone seeking medical advice should consult a health professional.